All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. So we're going to start our, our second day of data day. Uh, should have been data days, but worked out. Um, today we're going to be focusing a lot on kind of the, inf uh, the IRI integrated research infrastructure as well as some super facility projects. Um, and so we have some actual talks from uh, our super facility partners, some, some science talks. Um, so I'll, yeah, I'll let Debbie take it away with uh, IRI. All right. Thank you. So. Uh be talking about uh, yeah two things IRI the integrated research infrastructure some of you may be familiar with this some of you may not I want to give you a little bit of the kind of background behind IRI. this is what it means to stand up a new program within the Department of Energy uh, and how that has uh, really influenced how we're thinking about NERSC 10, NERSC 10 being our next system, the one that we are in the process of procuring. So that'll be the system after Perlmutter. So a bit of history here. NERSC for a long time has been supporting a lot of users and projects um, from the DOE's experimental and observational facilities. We have a long history of this. We've been doing this for 20, 30 years now. Um, and at the moment, this is, we're really noticing that this is a uh, increasing part of our workload in a couple of different dimensions. For one, the number of users from this community is, is pretty large. You know, we have large experiments with large collaborations with perhaps hundreds or maybe even a thousand members who are um, using NERSC in some way to access and process their data. So, this community makes up roughly a third of our user base, um, about 20% of our compute time, um, but the overwhelming majority of our storage capabilities. So the kind of profile of what experiments and observational facilities looks like is slightly different from our perspective uh, compared to some of the other communities that are really active users of NERSC. And we've recognized for a long time that some of the needs of these communities are a little different perhaps to your traditional simulation and modeling uh, only uh, uh, workload. Um, and so about five years ago, we really started talking about what it would mean to combine um, all the work that was ongoing um, the, the, within the different science teams, all the work that was going on kind of in the different re CS research communities, some of the things that ESNet was doing, some of the things that NERSC was doing, all kind of work piecemeal to try to support this community. And we kind of put this under the super facility concept. So the aim here was to connect experiments and compute facilities with the tools, the technologies, the infrastructure, and the know-how, the expertise, and the community that, that really helps uh, bring success. Because one of the things we noticed was that um, even though we might have uh, teams from very different science areas, perhaps from fusion energy, from uh, cosmology telescope surveys, a lot of the needs that they need, they had from our perspective are very similar. And we recognize that this is something that, you know, these disparate science communities have no way to communicate to each other about what they're doing and what they need and how they're using NERSC and how they're using ESNet. And so this is something that we wanted to, to bring together is kind of also make the connections for ourselves and how we can support this science in a more sustainable way, but also how help these science communities connect to each other a little bit better and learn from each other about what they're doing. Uh, so this was the super facility concept and we kind of kick-started the work that we planned here via a project. So this is a three-year super facility project. Um, it ran from 2019 to 2020. And this was really designed to gather requirements from a range of different science communities, build the base infrastructure and the services needed to support this science. And we we're focusing on a few different uh, key needs here, which is real-time computing support, really dynamic networking, uh, data management and movement tools, including Globus, but certainly not limited to Globus. There are many data management tools that people use in the community. We had a really big focus on automation and development first uh, ever fully functional uh, HPC API, which you'll be hearing about next. Um, we focused a lot on HPC scale notebooks with Jupyter about supporting really the first instance in, in the uh, DOE uh, Oscar for federated identity to make it easier for people to log in using their home institutions. 
And also, we have a huge effort around providing container-based edge services supported via SPIN. These are all services that we've been thinking about and we've been kind of developing in 2018 sort of time period. But we hadn't been thinking about uh, putting it together in a really coherent way, in a um, way that will be sustainable for the users and a way that will be sustainable for us to support with this large and growing science community that, that needed these different, uh, these different tools. So there are things that I'm really proud of uh, that we achieved with the Super Facility Project. Just to point out, the Super Facility Project might have finished in 2020, but the work certainly has not finished. This was a really tightly uh, coordinated effort to kickstart um, what we were trying to achieve with this. But the, the impact that this work has had is something that I'm really, I'm really proud of. It's something I think we did really well with. So the impact went far beyond the initial eight science teams that we had kind of as our close engagements within the super facility project that we were using to gather requirements. And the, there's a lot, more, uh, a lot more users at NERSC are able to take advantage now of, of what we've developed here. For example, we have more than 20 science teams using the real-time QR. Uh, more than 40 projects using the API, and we're getting something like one request to the API every two seconds, which gives you a sense of how people have really uh, adopted the, the API quickly and have made it an integral part of their workflows. We have a huge number of Jupyter users. We have a large number of scientists whose primary login uh, to NERSC is solely through Jupyter Notebooks, uh, which is really fantastic. And we have an enormous amount of uh, uh, science teams using SPIN. More than 85 projects are using SPIN um, to, to support their container-based edge services. So the work that we were doing within Super Facility, we had always wanted it to have a broader impact beyond the kind of initial uh, uh, community that we're trying to support, and it really has. So I want to point out as well that all these uh, teams that are using these these um, capabilities, they are not only from the experimental and observational facilities, they're from the whole of NERSC user community. So that's, that's something that's uh, had, it's had a much broader impact, I think, than we even expected. Um, and there's another way, uh, so we, we wrote a report, if anyone's interested in kind of reading some of the details of what we did and how we developed it and some of the uh, particularly how we managed a project like this that had so many different stakeholders across different divisions at Berkeley Lab and different science teams kind of across the world. Just uh, search for Super Facility Project Report and you can uh, see, see, what we, um, see what we did. Uh, but the other thing that I wanted to talk about is kind of the impact that this work had as a pathfinder for how science can be connected uh, more successfully across the DOE. So around, I'd say, about 2020, uh, just sort of during the, the, the beginning time of the pandemic, um, Oscar, the um, uh, Advanced Scientific Computing Research Office within DOE, started to um, think really cl closely about what it would mean to integrate the different facilities and the different resources that Oscar had to offer. And that quickly became uh, a broader vision of how to integrate DOE's research tools and research facilities all together, so beyond the, the OSCAR facilities, but also thinking about computing resources on campus and lab computing, uh, maybe cloud computing, and how people could use the different um, experimental and observational facilities in a way that's, uh, more, that's, that's seamless, that's kind of easier to, to move your workload from one experiment to another and from one computing center to another. This is a very broad vision, it's a very ambitious vision, just trying to make it easier for scientists to get their work. Increasingly, this is what we're seeing scientists need to do um, within the DOE, is that uh, workflows are spanning multiple facilities. And if you, you know, squint at this, this looks very similar to the super facility concept. And kind of that's what I mean when I say that um, super facility was a pathfinder for IRI by uh, demonstrating that it was possible to do this work of integrating um, uh, the kind of the capabilities at NERSC, at ESNet, that different experiment science teams needed to run at NERSC. We were able to demonstrate that something like IRI was feasible. Uh, and so this is something that DOE has been developing for the last couple of years through a series of different activities. So the program development, as I said, early 2020 was when the first task force was launched, kind of thinking about what this should look like, what does this mean? 
And then in uh, late 2021, we launched the IRI Blueprint activity. And this was an activity that brought together um, hundreds of scientists across the DOE to think really closely about what, it, what an IRI architecture should look like. So a very high level um, kind of discussion of the requirements of the uh, of the kind of infrastructure, the kind of tools, the resources, and more, most importantly, the kind of policies that would be needed, ooh, the kind of policies that would be needed uh, to bring together something that was really integrated across, at least across the Oscar facilities in the first place, but then more broadly, how could this extend to all DOE facilities? So we are now in 2023, 2024, in the start of the implementation phase, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about what that looks like. So the Blueprint activity identified uh, three science patterns, which are kind of representations of different ways that scientists use uh, uh, re infra research infrastructure, mainly based around computing needs. And then we also identified in this activity six practice areas. So these are kind of the work streams, the different work areas, the more practical areas where uh, we'll need to do some development work within the IRI program. And these include things like scientific data, life cycle, user experience, federated access, cybersecurity issues, you know, portable, scalable solutions, and of course, automation and interfaces, which you know, is things like the API and like Jupyter. So with this uh, kind of broad outline of the work that would need to be done, we're currently in the process of setting up a program um, to support IRR. This is currently unfunded. We're very much in the preliminary stages of this now. We're kind of spending quite a lot of time figuring out what the governance structure should be, for example. Um, but this is establishing this program as an agency priority goal for DOE for FY24-25. So this means this is really something that DOE is taking very seriously and is uh, tracking very carefully the work that is being done to support this. So there are different, like I said, different aspects of work that are happening and I really want to focus today just on the number one, investment in IRI foundational infrastructure. Uh, and this is referring to the fact that Oscar has a number of facilities um, like NERSC, uh, and we are all thinking very carefully about how we will design our next systems and adapt what we already have in place to support uh, IRI. Even as IRI is, is, is not completely defined at the moment, we're still uh, able to architect into our system designs the right hooks to make uh, it easier to interoperate between our facilities. Okay, so this is kind of the time frame then for our next system, NERS 10. Uh, you know, we've been, as you know, uh, from Edison to Corey to Palmer to really focusing on application, um, sort of moving, moving our users to advanced architectures, to more energy efficient architectures. With NERS 10, we have a slightly different focus on the workload because we're seeing changes in our user workload. Uh, and so we're focusing rather than on individual applications that might be uh, simulation and modeling, that might be experiment data analysis applications, we're looking at workflows that encompass all of these elements. So workflows that uh, might contain elements of simulation along with data analysis, along with AI training. We're seeing this as a real trend in our user base. More people are doing more complex workflows. And this is something that we really have to be ready to support for the NERS 10 system. And this is uh, reflected in our user requirements. Um, and again, these, we, we drew from the IRI architectural blueprint activity, all the requirements are identified there. We drew on that to, to um, feed into the mission uh, need statement for NURSE 10. So NURSE 10 system will accelerate end-to-end -end workflows. That's an important point here. We're accelerating full workflows, uh, not simply accelerating an individual application. Uh, and we, we highlight in this the integration of experiment data analysis and simulation. So what does this mean? Well, when we're thinking about the NERSE 10 architecture, it is designed to support these complex simulation and data analysis workflows at high performance. This is what we do at NERSC. So there are some elements in here around quality of service uh, to try to emphasize response time and throughput. 
Um, we're looking at aspects of, uh, of portability to be able to transfer your workflow across uh, HPC, across edge computing, maybe even to the cloud. We're looking at the programmability of the system all the way down. So APIs to manage data, execute code, and interact with system resources, which is something that we currently are not able to do. And we're looking at uh, other aspects of orchestration as well. So coordinating your workflow that might run across different resource domains. So this, we, we've been thinking about these kind of high level concepts and we spent the last year or so translating this into very um, crisp requirements that a vendor can understand. Um, and I'll come back to the time frame for, for uh, our interaction with the vendor in a moment. But I want to first just give you our perspective on what a workflow is. Workflow is a very overlooked term. And when we're going and talking to the vendor community, you know, they hear the word workflow, they might think of something completely different to us. Uh, and in, even within our, our health, the idea of what workflow looks like, people have different impressions of this. So we had to go through an exercise of writing down what we mean by a workflow, specifically an HPC workflow. Uh, and so we define this as, as again, uh, workflows interconnecting computational and data manipulation across high performance simulation, AI workflows, and data analytics. And again, this is not new. People have been running workflows for a long time. They have multiple steps around data flow, around control flow. Uh, but the complexity and the time sensitive nature of these workflows is what's changing. And we're seeing increasing need for um, infrastructure that can support this. Uh, so we identified six workflow archetypes to help define this vision. So these are the six different kind of flavors of workflow. They're intended to be fairly generic. But the process of defining these and kind of going through these was a really useful exercise internally as we sort of started to understand better what our workload is going to look like, what our users are trying to do in the next five to 10 years. But it was incredibly helpful for the vendor community to understand what does it mean to run a workflow on a supercomputer. And you know, we've been talking to a wide range of vendors for Nurse 10. Some of them are not traditional uh, Oscar um, uh, facility uh, vendors. So sort of being able to be uh, broad and inclusive in uh, in kind of our discussion with the vendors meant we really had to nail down what, uh, what scientists are doing on, on our systems and what we expect them to be doing in the future. <coughs> if you want to read more about this, uh, you can Google the NERSC workflows white paper. We've got a lot of detail in there. Uh, and this is something that we release with the RFP. So um, we've sort of gone, also gone through the exercise of looking at how these different types of workflows drive our technology capabilities. So how, what these different workflows need from a system and uh, things that we can do today, things that we can't do today. You know, for example, uh, networking and scheduling uh, quality of service, we currently can't really guarantee a certain level of performance in the network, in the scheduling and in our storage systems. Uh, but this is something that we want to be able to offer to users so that you can have a you know, reliable, uh, a time sensitive workflow can execute in a reliable way. So we've kind of, I'm just showing this to show that we've gone through a lot of these exercises internally to kind of make sure that the technologies that we're considering for Nurse 10 are really going to be useful across a broad range of science teams, a broad range of science applications. So there's two pieces that I kind of want to highlight here that we've been thinking about for Nurse 10 that really fit closely within this um, idea of supporting uh, cross-facility workflows, um, highly portable workflows kind of in the IRI model. One is a focus on innovation in software. So we think of software kind of in these four stages. You know, we've got the system hardware, we've got system software, then we have the workflow environments, and then the user software, the workflows that our, our users write and our scientists bring to us. So we're thinking about um, requirements around uh, supporting usage of both SSH and Jupyter, kind of what is equal status, how do we make sure that we can do that in a way that's uh, going to be really scalable. People, uh, a lot of people are looking at containerization. We heard about that yesterday. How do we really fully containerize the user environment and do this in a way that's a lot easier for people, for our users to use and also easy for us to administer? And we're looking at APIs on the system side as well as on the user facing side. How do we enable full automation and reconfigurability all down the stack? 
So this is one of the areas that we're, we're spending quite a lot of time thinking about and are talking to potential vendors about. And the other is uh, understanding what our needs are in terms of our file systems. We certainly recognize that uh, the performance of uh, the Scratch file system is, is not uh, particularly, uh, let's say, uh, predictable. Um, at the moment, we see that around 28, so nearly 30% of all node hours are used by jobs that run to the wall clock limit. Uh, so that means that they're checkpointing. We recognize checkpointing is really important for a lot of long-running simulations, long-running analysis jobs, but also uh, we, we also see checkpointing as, as a useful tool for um, being able to preempt a certain workload if we have an incoming urgent compute request. So we recognize that we need a file system that is designed for checkpointing and can provide good, reliable service for checkpointing. But also, we recognize that um, the IO performance on Perlmutter can be very variable. So uh, you look at the plot on the lower left there, you can see that, for example, in the right performance for IOR, we've got a very long tail. So about 20% 20 of all the right tests took more than twice as long as the, as the, mode, as the, as the mode in this study. And about 2% of all the writes took at least five times longer than the mode. And we recognize it's such unpredictability. I mean, it's an inherent part of the file system as it is currently designed. But if you have a time-dependent workflow, this kind of variance is catastrophic. It's, it's really bad. And, and plus, it's frustrating for everyone who's trying to use a file system. So uh, in our proposals for Nurse 10, we're asking for vendors to supply two different uh, file systems. A platform storage system, PSS, which will meet the needs of uh, our workload, the majority of our workload. This would be a parallel file system kind of in the traditional model. Uh, and then we're also asking for a quality of service storage system, which we're calling QSS. And this will provide controllable, guaranteed IOPS or bandwidth. This will meet the needs of time-sensitive workflows. So the workflows will be isolated to eliminate perturbations caused by kind of noisy neighbors hammering the file system at the same time as you're trying to use it. So we think that these, these are just some examples of the uh, technologies that we're, we're, we're looking for for Nurse 10 that we think will really help uh, the kind of workflows that we've been supporting for a long time in super facility and we expect to be supporting in IRR. So if you search uh, for Nurse R you'll find our technical requirements documents. Um, again, just we'll, this will be a CPU plus GPU machine. We do not specify a peak flops requirement. Instead, uh, the performance benchmarks uh, are workflow based. So we're, we're requesting a 10x improvement on our workflow component benchmarks. And as I said, we've been thinking a lot about the workflow environments in terms of the software environments as, also the, as well as the hardware. Um, and we are very close to officially releasing the RFP. Uh, so this should, depending on when we get all the approvals in place, it should be released in the next couple of weeks. We're keeping our fingers tightly crossed that we'll be able to do that. Uh, and once the RFP is officially released, then vendors have uh, six to eight weeks uh, to respond and to give us, our, give us proposals. So we're at a very exciting time for Nurse 10, um, and we are... Uh, yeah, really looking forward to hearing what the vendors are going to propose. And then we expect the main system delivery late 2026 and user access probably early 27. Okay, so uh, this is uh, my conclusion. I won't read through all of this, but I just want to emphasize again, everything that we've learned from working with science teams through the Super Facility Project, through IRI, through our iterations of the NISAP program, and from our many conversations with all our users, is really, um, really strongly influenced our des design plans for the Nurse 10 system. Um, and we are excited about what this system is gonna look like, and we're hopeful that it's gonna support our users' needs in a new way. All right, thank you. Um, are there any questions in the room or online for Debbie? Um, so this new concept of a QSS, would that be similar to like Scratch where it's a separate file system and then you would eventually have to offload that data to PSS? 
Yeah, we, we anticipate it looking something like that. We don't, again, we don't know exactly what the vendors are going to propose to us, but that's the model that we've been describing to them is how we would like it to, to operate. It would be similar to a scratch file, to the current scratch file system in terms of how you use it, but um, with this capability to have a guaranteed uh, bandwidth, say, for, for workloads that need it. So this won't be open to you all, Nurse workloads, it will only be open to those who really need this capability. Yeah. So, this is sort of a more general question. Uh, you've kind of uh, described, described uh, IRI. Do you know already of some ways that IRI will impact uh, NERSC? So for example, ECP became an important focus. Do you think it's, it's on the same order of magnitude? Yeah, so the question was, sorry, I should have uh, repeated the first question. The first question was about how people would use QSS. This question is about, do we have an idea now of how IRI do at NERSC? And I think it will have a, a, a significant impact. Um, if only because DOE is really bought into this concept. I mentioned that it's an agency priority goal to set up the IRI program. Uh, that's quite a serious deliverable that DOE has to has to uh, 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 has committed to. And Oscar, being the lead uh, office in IRI, we we have already had direction from our program managers on how we need to be thinking about IRI in our system design, in our user programs. People really want to know, how are you thinking about supporting IRI in the future and in the long term? This has to be a sustainable thing. It, not that ECP isn't sustainable, but ECP was a, you know, a, a program that had a, 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 was a project, so it had an end date. IRI is not projected to have an end date. IRI is just a new way for scientists to inter interoperate with uh, computing systems. So it has to be, it, this is why it's a program and not a project. So what should users be doing to get ready for these changes? I think that's a really good question. Uh, I mean, one of the simplest things is to take a look at the architectural blueprint activity report and see what uh, themes have emerged there. There's a pretty nice summary that's only a few pages long at the beginning that kind of summarizes what some of the key uh, requirements are and how that would translate into technologies that would be developed. So thinking about automation, thinking about using APIs, thinking about uh, how you might take advantage of containerization, how uh, you know, not everyone is going to need to have a portable workflow. Um, and so we, I don't anticipate that you know, the entirety of the nurse work uh, be engaged directly in IRI. But just like with the super facility project, we develop these tools and capabilities that are really useful for everyone. I think there are elements of the IRI kind of technology program that are going to be really useful for everyone. And so kind of just getting aware of that um, and, you know, looking out for more information in the next year or so as we get down, start getting down to specifics about what work is going to be done on the side of the OSCAR facilities to support IRI and kind of what technologies we're going to be prioritizing. But I can say that APIs are a big theme, like how do you interact interface with um, uh, different systems and different capabilities in, in a way that, uh, well, is more like modern programming style. That's, that's something that I think could be useful for everybody. Right. So, uh, I think we can, we can probably do one more question. Yeah. So, um, are you guys thinking about PDF? We are certainly thinking about HPDF. So HPDF is not something that I mentioned explicitly, but it's the high performance data facility, which is a brand new user facility. It is not every day that DOE approves the construction of a new user facility. So in a sense, it's pretty exciting. And it's a new user facility within OSCAR that is designed to, uh, it will be designed to take advantage of IRI, to really seamlessly integrate within IRI. Uh, and it's designed to be uh, a data resource. I think I have a slide here somewhere kind of talking about it. No, I don't. Well, anyway, uh, HPDF is it's designed to support uh, data intensive workloads. It is still very early days. Um, the 
It hasn't been awarded yet. There isn't yet an architectural plan for it. That's something that the team at JLab, in combination with the team at uh, Berkeley Lab, are, are working on actively. So we're really interested in this because NERSC, in particular, being you know, the mission HPC and data center for the Office of Science, we're going to be integrating with HPDF very closely. So I think it's of particular interest to us to make sure that HPDF is going to develop in a way that is very complementary to NERSC and that we have, we're, we're building the same interfaces together so that um, people who are running, you know, supercomputing style jobs at NERSC can take advantage of HPDF for the, you know, where appropriate. So we've got to think about workflows that can cross these, these boundaries. It's early days, but we're definitely thinking about it. Great. Well, thank you, Debbie.